about commuting matrices. Almost commuting matrices. Oh, oh yeah, that's even more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and to speak here. So a small disclaimer, I have several areas of interest and this is one of the connected components. So I hopefully the least technical one. So I'll be talking about matrices. So let's consider just two MBA matrices. Self-adjoint. And let's also assume that their norms are bounded by one. Okay, so we'll call them almost commuting informally if their commutator is small, also in the operator norm. So almost commuting. If the norm of the commutator of this matrices, let's denote it by delta, is small. And the natural question you can ask is, does it imply that they're close to exactly commuting matrices? Well, so interesting things happen if we try to ask this question independently of the dimensions. So can we find an estimate such that uh, smallness of the commutator guarantees smallness of the distance to commuting pair of matrices? So can we find y prime close to x and y such that they commute? And this question is quite old, so it dates back to Paul Halmosh. I think it's from 1960s. Uh, and you can also reformulate it in a more simple way in terms of one matrix. If you look at the matrix A equals X plus I Y, then basically the commutator of X and Y is just a self commutator of A. And this X and Y commute if and only if A is normal. So. You can formulate it like this. So can we, so can we estimate the distance from A to normal matrices? So distance from A normal matrices bounded by some function of the norm of the self commutator. It's called self commutator. So can we find such function f? Obviously. If we allow f to depend on the dimension, the answer is simple, yes, and this is the exercise on just compactness. You can prove it by contradiction or from some other theories about compact things, because unit ball in this set of matrices is compact. But if you want this f to be independent of the dimension, this question was open for quite a while, and uh, uh, a positive answer was given by Huaxin Lin. So theorem by Lin. 93. So basically that such function exists. So f exists, exists uniformly in n. And goes to zero as the argument goes to zero, obviously. As delta goes to zero. Sorry? What norm? Oh, just the operator norm. Okay. Operator norm. So there are results about other norms, for example, Hubel Schmidt norm, uh, but they're actually more simple than the operator norm. Uh, okay, but, in, so, but interesting things about this theorem is that it doesn't give you any information about how fast this f goes to zero. So it's a purely existence type statement. And the proof basically goes by contradiction. So if this doesn't exist, then you can find the sequence of matrices such that the estimate becomes worse and worse. And then you consider this sequence as element of some sister algebra of sequences, and then you work in this sister algebra. So it actually follows from some relatively deep arguments for sister algebras. And a reference for this, if you want to study the proof, it's really beautiful. It's a paper by Fries and Rordam, 94, which basically called a short proof of Lin's theorem. So it only requires elementary knowledge of sister algebras. Okay, but the... Uh, well, so you need to be able to approximate uh, el elements of real rank zero sister algebras by elements with finite spectrum. So I mentioned this algebra of sequences of matrices. You consider the ideal that of matrices that go to zero. You look at the projection of the, to the quotient algebra, and you need to kind of invert this projection. OK, so I don't really have time to go into details, but I can explain uh, later. OK, but the question, 
whether you can find the quantitative, quantitative version of this function was open. And of course, the conjecture was that it's just this norm to the power one half. Well, it happens uh, whenever the dimension is fixed. So it's very easy to obtain estimate like C of n delta to the power one half. Okay. And it also follows from, it also natural ex expectations from homogeneity reason because this distance is linear basically, and this has homogeneity too. Okay. So one half is the best you can get. Okay, and we actually know how to prove this, but uh, before I go to our results, let me make several remarks just to advertise this, this question a little bit. So remarks. So basically the remarks are that if you try to generalize this question a little bit to more general situation, most likely it will become false. So for example, it fails for operators in Hilbert space. Fails <coughs> for B of H. So if instead of matrices you consider operators in the Hilbert space, the answer is no. Even though it's the previous answer is uniformly dimensional. So this is a purely infinitely dimensional phenomenon. And uh, a counterexample is actually very easy to describe. So we consider the space L2 of n, just square summable one-sided sequences. And A, n will be the following weighted shift operator. So there are zeros here on the diagonal, the zeros below the diagonal. Here we have 1 over n, 2 over n, and so on until we reach 1. Then it keeps going one. It's actually some kind of folklore. If you want to find the counterexample operator theory, most likely it's going to be a weighted shift. And this is the case. It's even easy to explain why this is okay. So this has small self commutator. It's a simple computation, and it's easy to explain why it's not close to normal operators. Basically, you need to look at the spectrum of this operator. The spectrum is the unit disk because it's a compact perturbation of the shift operator. And for shift operator, you know everything. And the essential spectrum is the boundary of this disk, the unit circle. And inside of this uh, disk, you can compute the Fredholm index. So index of An minus lambda identity equals actually 1, I think, or minus 1. I always confuse. But anyway, so index, index is not 0. This is actually an abstraction, because you cannot destroy non-trivial index by perturbation of norm less than the distance to essential spectrum. So, and this only happens in infinite dimensions, of course, because there is no essential spectrum in the finite dimension. This is one example. And another example is that if you replace self-adjoint matrices by unitary matrices, it also becomes false. And there is a, another topological type of structure. So two fails for unitary matrices. Again, if we are looking for estimates independent of the dimension. And again, counterexample, it's easy to write down. I think it's called Voiculescu's unitaries. So un is the just a cyclic permutation and dimensional space. 1, 0, 0. Just a cyclic permutation. And vn is the dual, the, Fourier, the discrete Fourier transform of its sort of diagonal e to the 2 pi i k over n. So it, again, it's easy to check that the commutator of this matrix is, is of the order 1 over n, but they are not close to commuting ones. And the abstraction can also be written down. So you need to consider the following curve. So 0, 1. So t maps into the following thing. Determinant t u v plus 1 minus t v u. This is a closed curve because determinant of uv equals determinant of vu in the complex plane. And it also doesn't approach 0 because uv and vu are almost commuting. So you can compute the winding number of this curve. And winding number is an abstraction. So these matrices have winding number not 0. I forgot what it equals to. But there is a result by Lin and Gong. Uh, saying that if this number is zero, then you can actually perturb them to computing uniformly. And if it's not zero, then they are uniformly separated from computing. So this is a counterexample, but the result works for any pair of unitary matrices. So 
The question is also answered in this case, but again, the estimates are non-quantitative. And about this result, uh, there is also a result by Fries and Rodin, which say that if index is zero, then analog of that result holds, again, with non-quantitative version of f. Okay, so th this question about, so this question was open, and uh, we basically did it with uh, Yuri Safarov, um, and that result has non-trivial intersection with my PhD thesis. Okay, so theorem. So for, so we formulate the result in terms of uh, operators in Hilbert space. So for A, A belongs to B of H. Distance from A to normal operators, so let's write it down as normals, is bounded by the sum of two things. The norm of the self-commutator in the optimal power one half, and if the dimension is finite, then that's it. The second term will be zero. So in general, second term equals the following thing. So plus supremum lambda belongs to C, distance from A minus lambda identity to the invertible operators. So GL of H by GL of H is not bounded invertible operators. A minus lambda identity is just A minus lambda identity. So this term vanishes in all previous situations except this one. So it, it vanishes for matrices and it vanishes whenever uh, this index abstraction vanishes. And there is some geometrical interpretation of this term actually. If you look at the spectrum of A, so let me draw a picture. Uh, yes, basically. Yeah. Okay, I'll just leave this like that. So f let's say this is a spectrum of A. And so there is essential spectrum and there is non-essential spectrum. So basically good points are the whole essential spectrum and non-essential spectrum on which index is zero. So the only areas we need to take care about is the places where Fred, Fred, Fred home index is defined and is not zero. Let's say there are two spots on which spectrum link is not zero. And then the right-hand side will be basically of the order of the size of these spots. So this result allows you to tell something even if the Fred Holm index is not zero, but it has small support. So it's like a quantitative version. It, it also cannot be improved in, because this is actually, you can prove this, the, there is a lower bound of the same type. Okay, so this is kind of a, Recent result and just a few words about how much time do I have? Oh, that's great. <laughs> so, well, so there are several things I'm interested in right now. Well, so um, the question about unitary matrices, a quantitative version is still open. And uh, I believe that uh, this technique has enough analysis to deal with it, provide, because this topological part is already done. Mm, so it would be nice to obtain a quantitative version. And also there are some relations to physics. So I'm not really an expert in that area of physics, but uh, questions like this arise in the theory of topological insulators. So um, there are some people saying that there are 10 different types of symmetry for these insulators. It's called like the tenfold something. And basically, yeah, so this is, this is one of them and there are nine, nine other ones. So it would be nice to obtain constitutive results for each of these uh, 10 cases. And uh, yeah, I'm cur currently looking into this, and if anyone can explain me more about topological insulators, it would be very welcome. Okay, maybe I'll stop here. <laughs>